Chapter 19 is on climate change. The first point I want to make is that climate change is a synonym for what used to be called more commonly global warming, and an even older term is the greenhouse effect. It's called global warming because the global mean temperature is predicted to increase, and already has increased. Although, in any one particular point on the Earth's surface, that doesn't necessarily mean the temperature goes up. There are some places where temperature is going to go down, and that's why climate change is probably a more appropriate term for this than global warming. The greenhouse effect, because as we'll see in just a few moments, um, when we uh, when we get down to the to hear the, the science behind the greenhouse effect, what carbon dioxide does, is that the uh, basic physical ideas underlying climate change is the same as what happens in a greenhouse. Second point, uh, the greenhouse gases include water, which is H2O, carbon dioxide, which is CO2, H here, of course, stands for hydrogen over oxygen, C for carbon. Uh, CH4 is methane, which is the main component in natural gas. Also, N2O, nitrous oxide. Now, nitrogen and oxygen don't always combine in the, form, in the ratio two nitrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. So sometimes we, we write uh, uh, N with an X subscript O to denote the fact that sometimes you have more than, you have a different number than two nitrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. And this class of chemicals that all have the chemical um, f formula N, N with some X subscript and then O are uh, sometimes referred to as uh, NOx. And finally, CFCs, which are chlorofluorocarbons. We will talk a lot more about CFCs in Chapter 20. So these are greenhouse gases. Uh, water, the first greenhouse gas here, uh, in the form of water vapor, is a very important component of the atmosphere. The most important greenhouse gas in terms of the human effect, that is the, the, the one that, that humans have been responsible for changing most importantly is carbon dioxide, CO2. Although humans are also responsible for all these others, uh, methane, ni uh, nitrous oxides, CFCs. The next point, let's talk about where carbon dioxide comes from. Carbon dioxide comes from the combustion of fossil fuels. Now, fossil fuels can be fairly simple. Uh, like coal, or pretty complicated like petroleum, or somewhere in between like uh, natural gas. But the fundamental underlying chemical reaction is this one. The fossil fuel contains carbon, C. When you burn carbon, you combine it with oxygen. So the left-hand side of this chemical equation is the burning of carbon. When you burn carbon, it results in carbon dioxide, CO2, plus heat. And that heat is the reason why we're burning the fossil fuel, because we can turn heat into uh, work. Or sometimes you want the heat just for itself, like to heat a house. But you can, it can also be turned into mechanical work, such as propelling an automobile. Now. At an abstract level, this is, in some basic sense, what happens when you combust any uh, fossil fuel. But how about at a specific level? Well, at the specific level, things can get pretty complicated. And what I've, um, what I've gotten here from the, the Department of Energy is an example of how complicated things can sometimes be. This is a com combined reaction, well, it's a two-step reaction that begins 
with methane, CH4, just like here's methane. And ends with CO2 plus hydrogen. So the first point is that you start with CH4, which is, you know, has carbon, and you end up with CO2. So there's a sense in which this is just an example of the the, the fundamental equation that I started with over here. This specific form, though, has some interesting properties, and the most interesting property is that it's the way that nowadays hydrogen is commercially produced. Hydrogen is interesting because hydrogen itself can be used as a fuel, and the reaction is 2H2 plus oxygen yields 2H2O, which is water, plus energy. So the left-hand side reflects essentially burning hydrogen, and the only result of it is water, which is of course a perfectly clean energy source, uh, water plus, plus energy. So it's of interest to think about uh, where hydrogen comes from, and there are lots of places where hydrogen could come from. Electrolysis of water is one, but as I said, the most common place for hydrogen to come from right now is is it's made from methane using using these two reactions. What's interesting about this is yes, you still get CO two, just like here, so this doesn't avoid producing CO2, but it's interesting from an environmental standpoint because of where the CO2 is produced. In, in this reaction, the CO2 is produced in, a, in, in an industrial plant where the reaction is taking place. And so you have all the CO2 being concentrated in this one plant, and you might be able to, the verb is sequester it, which is to put it under the ground, uh, preferably in some kind of geological formation where the CO2 chemically combines with the rocks and so it doesn't have to be kept under pressure. Whereas in the more conventional combustion places, for example in your automobile engine, you have CO2 being produced by thousands upon thousands of separate automobiles and it's really hard, it would be really hard to prevent that CO2 from entering the atmosphere. So, so, so this reaction is essentially a method of making sure that the CO2 can be produced in just one place where you might be able to sequester it. And then what you do is to distribute the hydrogen to people's homes, to their automobiles, through a system of pipelines. You can use uh, the natural gas, the same pipelines that are used to transport natural gas. And then when the hydrogen gets burned to turn into energy over here, you don't have any locally produced pollution. So the point is that you can describe the chemistry that goes on when fossil fuels are used in a modern economy, either in an abstract level or you can get into a lot of specifics. But ultimately, using fossil fuels to produce energy creates carbon dioxide as a byproduct. So that's where the carbon dioxide comes from. So next point, how much carbon dioxide have we been producing? The book lets you know that anthropogenic increase in the atmosphere's CO2 concentration has been about a third since the year 1800. The term anthropogenic means caused by humans, and it's a term that you hear quite often when you discuss climate change. Uh, so a synonym would be human caused. So the combustion of fossil fuels has caused a quite considerable change in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
So the next question is, what does this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere do? And what exactly do we mean by the greenhouse effect? But let me uh, discuss the, the, the way a, a, a greenhouse, well, I was going to say the, the way a greenhouse works. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that first and then I'll talk about um, CO2 in the atmosphere. So the way the greenhouse works is you have a little structure that's made of glass. So the walls are made of glass, the roof is made uh, to a large extent of glass. You have the sun over here, and the sun, sun's light has a certain wavelength. And let's say that wavelength is, uh, is fairly short and can pass through the glass. But then what happens is the light strikes an object, perhaps the ground. It gets uh, the absorbed, the light energy gets absorbed. The ground gets warmed, and the ground re-radiates. So some of the energy is turned back into, into photons, into light. It might not be in the visible spectrum, but it's light. But it has a different wavelength. Maybe it's this wavelength, a longer wavelength. And glass has a property that it'll let the small wavelength in but it won't let, it, that is, it's transparent to small wavelengths, but it's not transparent to long wavelengths. So when the long wavelength light hits the glass, it can't get through, so it bounces back and sticks around. So the energy entering the greenhouse is not the same as the energy leaving the greenhouse. Energy can easily, energy in the form of photons can easily get into the greenhouse, but they can't get out of the greenhouse. And therefore, you have a buildup of energy inside the greenhouse, and that's what causes the temperature to go up. This is exactly the same phenomenon as why a car that's parked in the sun on a summer day can get extremely hot, because, again, glass is not equally transparent to all wavelengths. So that's what the literal greenhouse effect is. Does. How about the greenhouse effect when we're talking about climate change? So, again, we've got the sun there, we've got the surface of the earth. So, we have short wavelength light that hits the surface of the earth. It gets absorbed and re-radiated as long wavelength. Now think about the atmosphere as being above the Earth's surface. The atmosphere is fairly transparent to the incoming short wavelength light, but it's not nearly as transparent to the outgoing long wavelength light. And in fact, this long wavelength light gets absorbed by the atmosphere. The photons never get out of the atmosphere. And so again, you don't have an energy balance. The energy going into the atmosphere from the sun is greater than the energy that comes out, and so you have an increase in temperature. And the reason why you have an increase in temperature is that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. As, as, as we mentioned over here, that CO2 is a greenhouse gas. So CO2 functions to change the quality of the atmosphere's transparency to different wavelengths of light in a way that makes it function like the glass in the greenhouse. So that's what carbon dioxide does. Is this effect significant? What is the history of climate change? Let me first point out that the fact that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas is rather easy to experimentally demonstrate and was demonstrated 
experimentally first in the 1800s. I believe it was the 1880s, but I'm not exactly sure. What you do is you fill a something like an aquarium a con container with CO2. You pass a beam of light through it. And then you pass the light through a prism. And as you probably know, when you pass a light through a prism, let's see, I was momentarily interrupted. Let me get back to what I was talking about. I think we were over here, and I was discussing how in the roughly 1880s, scientists first determined that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas. So if you pass light, through uh, carbon dioxide and then pass it through a prism then as you know what a prism will do is it will break the light stream up into different um, different frequencies of light uh, what's it red orange yellow green blue indigo violet I think that's the order and and what you can see is that some of those frequencies are missing some of those colors are missing and whereas if the if the uh, aquarium sort of a box is filled with air instead of with CO2 then you have all the frequencies of light so it's a very simple experiment to do to show that CO2 is not transparent to all frequencies of light but that it's opaque to some frequencies that it absorbs some frequencies of light now once scientists had discovered this it it was actually almost obvious even to them in the 1880s that this could potentially have an effect on the Earth's climate because they knew that the Industrial Revolution was being powered by coal, by burning fossil fuels. And so starting in as far back as the late 19th century there were some scientists that got worried that burning all these fossil fuels, excuse me, fossil fuels would cause the greenhouse effect and therefore the Earth's temperature to rise. However, this was a minority view. Most scientists in the late 19th century and the early part of the 20th century, although they certainly believe this experiment that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas because it's such a, a clear and straightforward experiment, most scientists did not think that this was going to have a significant effect on the Earth's climate. And the reason is because another greenhouse gas is water vapor. And it turns out there's way more water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere than there is carbon dioxide. And the reasoning of the majority of scientists was, yes, we're emitting a whole bunch of CO2, we're changing the atmosphere's CO2 concentration. Yes, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. A gas. Yes, this is going to cause the Earth's temperature to increase, but it's going to increase only by a tiny, tiny amount. Because when you look at the total of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the CO2 is overwhelmed by the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. And the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is not changing. So the water vapor contribution dwarfs the CO2 contribution and therefore an increase in the CO2 concentration of the kind that we're seeing those scientists felt really is simply not enough to significantly change climate significantly change temperature and that view did not change until the 1950s and 1960s what happened in the 1950s and 1960s was scientists began to be able to use computers to model the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's climate. And the first models agreed with the majority view that increases in the CO2 concentration were not going to increase global mean temperature very much. But as computers got more powerful, the models that they were able to the program on these computers got more complicated. And they started to be able, uh, at around this time, the 1950s, uh, especially in the 1960s, to model the atmosphere not as just one homogeneous substance, uh, 
but to model the lower atmosphere differently from the middle atmosphere, differently from the upper atmosphere. And what they realized was, yes, the atmosphere has a whole lot of water vapor, but most of it is in the lower atmosphere. The upper atmosphere is actually very dry. Carbon dioxide, however, doesn't just stay in the lower atmosphere. Carbon dioxide goes into the middle and other upper layers of the atmosphere as well. So when you're looking at the upper atmosphere, you have a situation where before CO2 emissions, it was very, very dry. There wasn't any, there isn't any water vapor. And now when you start having CO2 emissions, the CO2 gets into the upper atmosphere and drastically changes the characteristics of the upper atmosphere. So this, this modeling caused the majority opinion of the scientific community to start to change. They realized that CO2 wasn't going to affect the greenhouse gas characteristics of the lower atmosphere, but it was going to drastically change the greenhouse gas characteristics of the upper atmosphere. And that had the potential of drastically changing the Earth's climate. And as you know, the, ma the majority view now, uh, essentially the unanimous view of almost all climate scientists, uh, is that this anthropogenic generation of greenhouse gases is definitely going to increase the global mean temperature. So that's the history of climate change science. I only have one more topic on this video before we move to the next, and that is here what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said about global warming so far. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is abbreviated the IPCC. They are the group which won the Nobel Prize together with former Vice President of the U.S. Al Gore a few years ago for their reports on climate change. The IPCC is an organization that was established by the United Nations to give it scientific and technical advice about climate change. The IPCC doesn't do its own research, but it communicates with researchers all over the world and it writes reports together with these researchers every few years about how the science of climate change has advanced. So um, your book talks about the IPCC and um, and what they say is that so far uh, the warming has been about a half a degree Celsius. To give an order of magnitude comparison, the so-called Little Ice Age in Europe between the 14th and 17th centuries corresponded to a decrease in temperatures of around one degree Celsius. So a one degree Celsius temperature change is quite noticeable even to people who aren't scientists like in the 14th through 17th centuries. The likely change caused by anthropogenic e emissions of greenhouse gases is projected to be two degrees Celsius or more. Sometimes you hear rather dramatic estimates of changes in the order of five or even six degrees Celsius. Remember that a Celsius degree is quite a bit larger than a Fahrenheit degree. It's not twice as large, but it's um, it's quite a bit larger. So I think I'm going to leave it uh, at that and we'll continue with climate change part two in the next video.